Okay, welcome back. So uh, now we're going to start by giving some definitions of games, some basic definitions of how we represent games, um, players, strategies, and payoffs. And what we'll start with is what's known as a normal form representation of a game, also known as strategic form, and it's the simplest representation of a game. And in particular, what we'll do is, is first we'll go through these basic definitions of how games are represented, and then we'll talk about how to solve them. So in terms of representing a game, um, there's basically uh, three main ingredients here. So we have players, um, strategies, and payoffs. And let's take the, those each in turn. And in particular, we'll start with players. So in terms of the, the players who we'll, we'll include in a game are the people who are actively making the decisions in the game. And uh, you know it's not always an easy, uh, completely cut and dry problem as to how one models a situation. So for instance, if we were thinking about modeling uh, countries negotiating, so say the United States is negotiating with another country, uh, do we represent those as countries, each as one player? So the U.S. is a single player maximizing some particular payoff? Or is, is the United States actually a group of politicians who might have their own agendas? Um, or is a country uh, a population of people who interact in a very complicated way to make decisions? Um, depending on, on how detailed you want the model to be, you might, might represent the players very differently. So there's a lot embedded in who we think the players are in the game. And generally, we'll, we'll, we'll start with some set of players as an accepted uh, starting point. And then we have to decide um, what are their strategies. So what are the possible actions that each player can take? Um, is, is passive and active enough of a distinction in order to really capture the details of what's going on in a predator-prey relationship? Well, pro probably not in, in full detail, but at least in, in terms of getting a broad cut at things, it might be. So how we choose to, to model the strategies and the actions that are available to, to different players will make a difference in the type of analysis and the richness of the analysis that we uh, end up with. So when we get to a normal form, we have then a set of players, um, and we'll let n capital N denote the set, um, usually we're dealing with a finite set of players, so say one through some little number n, so we're using little n to, num to denote the number of players who are in the game. And then each set of players has some set of actions available. So are they active or passive in the predator-prey relationships? Uh, we'll look at different uh, sets of actions and different examples. So we'll have some set A sub i where uh, the subscript I indicates the, the player to whom that action set is uh, attached. So these are the actions of player I. And it could be that different players have different types of, of strategies. Um, so it could be that predators uh, have different uh, strategies available to themselves than prey. Uh, profiles of actions are then going to be n tuples of, uh, of strategies uh, or actions. So in particular, when we have um, the cross product of the different actions, we'll let A denote the, f the full set a of, of actions. So an element A in A would then be a specification of A equals what is person one doing, player one, what is player two doing, all the way through what player N is doing. So it's going to be an N tuple each listing what every player does in the game. And then in order to to be able to say something intelligent about how players are going to act, generally the way that this is modeled in game theory is to assume that there's some sort of payoff function or utility function. So a uh, utility function is going to tell each player, um, player i for instance, as a function of the actions taken, what's a, a number which represents how well they did, what's their payoff. So it's also be uh, referred to as the payoff function. Um, and it tells us uh, how each player evaluates each set of actions in the game. So just in terms of examples, if we go back to our predator-prey relationship, uh, we represented that as here n was uh, the set of two players, 
the predator and the prey. Um, they each had action spaces, in this case, that were identical. They could either be active or passive, so they each had two actions available. And then we represented these in terms of payoffs by a, a number which represented how well they each did as a function of this, of this uh, pair of actions that were played. So if they both were active, then uh, the um, predator got a payoff of two. So here the predator is listed as the row player. So player one is often listed as the row player. Player two often be listed as the column player. So we have one over here, the predator, two over here, the column player. And then the entries in the normal form then indicate what the payoffs are. So the row player's payoff generally comes first. So if they're playing active and active, then the predator, who's player one, the row player, is getting a payoff of two. So each cell lists the two players' payoffs as a function of what the actions are. So if they're passive and active, then the predator is going to get a payoff of three and the prey will get a payoff of minus six, and so forth. Okay, so this is the, what's known as the normal form representation of a game or a game in strategic form. Um, here's another example, a uh, simple collective action uh, game. So think of, of two players. They can uh, both decide whether to revolt against an authority or not to revolt. If they both revolt, then they're successful. So player one here can choose either revolt or not. Player two, the column player, can choose to revolt or not. If they both end up revolting, then player one gets a one, player two gets a one, they're successful in their, rev their revolution. If only one shows up to the revolution, that's not good for the person who shows up. Uh, they're, they're not strong enough alone to, to have a successful revolt. Um, so for instance, if the column player revolts, and the role player chooses not to, or the role player stays home, gets a payoff of zero, uh, regardless of what happens then, but the, um, the player who goes to the revolution, the column player in that case, gets a minus one. Um, so this is a game where if they both uh, choose to revolt, they get a, a, a payoff of one. If they both don't, nothing happens, they get a payoff of zero. If one revolts and the other doesn't, then the one who revolts uh, is in a failed revolt and actually um, uh, does worse than, than not revolting in that situation. Okay, so this is a collective action game. They'd both like to get the higher payoff from the revolution, but they don't want to be there in, unless they're sure the other person's going to revolt. So in terms of the players and the action spaces and the payoff function here, um, the set N is the set 1, 2. The actions are revolt or not for both players, so this is a symmetric game. Um, they both have the same strategy space. They both have the same uh, payoff function as a function of, of the possible uh, pairs of, of actions for themselves and for the other. Uh, in this case, um, if they both revolt, they get a payoff of 1 and so forth. So we can represent that in terms of listing the, the N, the AIs, and the UIs, or often if it's just a two-player game, it'll be represented simply in terms of a matrix, which lists the actions for the role player, player one, column player, player two, and then in each entry lists what each player gets as a function of those possible actions. Okay, so, so let's make a few comments just about payoff functions or utility functions in a game. Uh, you know, it's very important to specify them because they're going to determine what the players want to do and how we solve games and what predictions we make. And if you get the wrong payoff specified, you'll get the wrong kinds of predictions. And in particular, one thing that's very important is understanding what motivates players. So is it just simply their own payoff, so they're completely selfish and they care only about what their payoff is? Are they altruistic? Do they actually care about what happens to other players in the game? Um, so if we're in a situation where there might be relationships between the players, there's friendships or uh, families uh, or other uh, situations where one person cares about another, they might care about what, how the outcome affects the other person in, in evaluating what the payoff should be in a particular, for a particular set of actions. 
do they care about relative outcomes? Is it, is it a situation where they want to be better than somebody else? Um, do they care about fairness? Do they care that they get as much as somebody else does in the game or they're as successful as somebody else? So all of these kinds of things can enter into people's considerations in terms of how they evaluate actions. And to the extent that these things do, we want to make sure that we've represented those properly in the payoff function and that the payoff function is capturing exactly what uh, is, is motivating the players in terms of choosing their actions. Okay, let's talk quickly about uh, two interesting families of games. Um, uh, ones that have been fairly well studied. Team games or the uh, essentially fully cooperative games in the sense that uh, players will get the same payoffs as a function of the actions and, and would like to coordinate. And then the antithesis of that zero-sum games where players are really in competition and one player's gain is another player's loss. So uh, a, a simple example of a team game um, is just a pure coordination game. Here players can choose either left or right, for instance, uh, which side of the street they drive on or which side of the sidewalk they walk on. Um, if each person in going in a different direction chooses to always go to their left, that's fine. Uh, they avoid each other. They'll get a, each a payoff of 1-1. One, one. If each player goes to the right, um, they avoid colliding with each other. So each person goes to their own right then uh, they, they avoid each other. Um, but if, if one player is, is following a, a convention where they go to the right, the other person goes to the left, then they hit each other, they're not getting as high a payoff. So they get zero payoffs when they collide and otherwise are, are doing well. So this is a, an example of a team game where the payoffs to the players are um, uh, basically the same for both players as a function of whatever uh, happens in, in terms of the outcomes. Um, for any two players then in terms of a team game and we look at a, an, an action profile A so this is a profile uh, for instance um, A1 through AN when we think of a team game then when we look at any two players uh, no matter who they are as a function of A they're getting exactly the same payoff so it's they, they share exactly the same incentives as a function of the, the actions. Um, <clears throat> a more general condition is that uh, people have uh, identical preferences over strategy profiles. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that um, a little later in terms of, of strategy profiles when we talk about mixed strategies and so forth. But effectively, um, the, the uh, definition extends directly when one allows for mixtures and other kinds of, of uh, more richer games in terms of timing. And effectively, these are also known as pure coordination games, common payoff games, um, team games. They'll go by a, a variety of names. But these are games where there's a, a, a strong co uh, uh, coordination in the player's interest or congruence in the player's interest. Okay, another class of games, zero-sum games, are ones uh, where players are in pure competition. Here are two of the basic, most basic examples of zero-sum games. Um, so zero-sum is the situation where the sum of the payoffs to the two players is always equal to zero. And here, uh, for instance, matching pennies, um, this is a situation where players are, are choosing either heads or tails. The row player is choosing heads or tails. Column player is choosing heads or tails. Row player wins if the, the, there's a match in the two players' actions. So either heads, both heads or both tears, tails. Uh, but the column player wins if there's a mismatch. So the column player would like them to mismatch. The row player wants to match. Matching pennies, simple game. Um, the game that you saw you have and I playing on our introductory video, uh, rock, paper, scissors. Uh, that's a game where each player is choosing rock, paper, or scissors. Um, if they both choose the same action, there's a stalemate, nobody wins. Um, if the row player, for instance, picks paper, and the uh, column player chooses rock, then the row player wins. Uh, one minus one is the payoff, et cetera. So, so rock, paper, scissors is a simple game. You can represent it here. Again, it's a game where one player wins, the other game lose, other player loses. Um, so the, the, there's a, a positive payoff for one player, a negative one for the other, and they balance out in sum to, to zero. Um, rock, paper, scissors, also known as Rochambeau, a very simple and, and classical game. So zero-sum games generally 
the interesting cases will be limited to two-person games. Um, and uh, so often when we, when we refer to zero-sum games, we're referring to two-person games. You can have a general n-person situation where you've got a zero-sum game. But the, the idea here is, again, that the payoffs of the players as a function of the actions sum up to zero. Um, there's a, a classic result by uh, von Neumann and Morgenstern in the 1940s um, that said that basically any n-person game can always be a, converted into an equivalent n plus one person zero-sum game. You just, whatever's left over that doesn't sum to zero, you have the, the n plus one person's payoff be equal to the minus of what the sum of everybody else's payoffs are. It always sums to zero. Um, and in some sense, that's been taken, interpreted as saying that, uh, th that the interesting situation is when you're dealing with zero-sum games. And we'll see that, that some of the results, the classic results in, in two-person games and zero-sum games um, are, are really uh, spe somewhat special to two-person games. Um, very important point, zero is not critical. Um, everything that you can say about zero-sum games, you can say about constant sum games. So it's not important that they sum to zero. They could sum to some number k, for instance, uh, as long as the whatever benefits one player, if they get a payoff above k, then the other person has to be pushed down below k. These are also known as games of pure conflict, pure competition, they're adversarial games. Uh, and, and a lot of the early work in game theory was on two-person sum, uh, two-person zero-sum games, partly because they have a nice mathematical structure and uh, the, the, a lot of the early work was done by mathematicians in this area, and there was uh, uh, a, a number of interesting theorems that they proved in, in that time.